Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Swati. Okay. So um, before I start here, I want to put in a, a, a plug for fam ALD Family Weekend. So this is, um, so we had our first in-person family weekend this past year, and it was terrific. We had several families make the trip to Los Angeles area f uh, to attend the Painted Turtle Camp. Um, I think we can agree that it was a real success. Families had a terrific time. Um, we have room for, depending on where we are in the COVID uh, pandemic, between 15 and I think like 45 families, depending on where, where we are. So we're really looking to um, uh, boost turnout this year and uh, go for a great uh, family event. It's a really wonderful weekend. It's pure fun. It's not, um, it's really not intended to be an, an educational, it's a sort of a week weekend of vacation. So if you can make it, um, it's a really wonderful opportunity for kids and families both to um, kind of unwind and connect with other families. I highly recommend it. It'll be August 3 to 6 uh, this summer. And um, we'll, I think there's a video we'll be showing sometime later in the event. So I'll, um, okay, Dean, I'll, we'll, if you don't mind pulling up the other slide, that'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to give an update. I've um, presented a couple times in the past on where we are in researching vitamin D. Uh, we're interested in vitamin D as a as a uh, potential preventive therapy for um, preventing cerebral ALD. Again, it's a these are potentials, not not actual known therapies. But this is um, a follow up from where we left off on some of the last presentation. I, I'm not really showing any new data today. I'm actually going to tell you where we're at and sort of the administrative process uh, of setting up studies. So this is uh, something of an administrative talk. So I do want to, um, I think uh, Dr. Malik mentioned the idea of prevention yesterday, and I want to re-highlight that here in, um, in that, uh, let me see if I can get a cursor here. No, not quite, but, um, but the way we think of ALD now, so we think, you're, you know, we, we know people are born with a genetic alteration in the ABCD1 gene, and that causes a biochemical change that leads to uh, um, a number of processes, which we understand very modestly at this point. Uh, but what we can agree on is, is that not everyone is destined to have all the same symptoms, and some are not destined to have any of the symptoms we think of as part of ALD. And um, I think the, the most uh, the most salient feature of that uh, uncertainty, for better and for worse, is the cerebral disease. So as um, all boys start life with uh, a normal brain MRI, as, as shown here. And what we're looking for in the serial MRI surveillance is a lesion, a small one, maybe like this. And this is what we're looking for as a signal to go, typically, to transplant, to prevent the lesion from going on to look like this. And right now when we, you know, our therapies can stop lesions at this point in, in, in many cases with bone marrow transplant or and or gene therapy. Well, our goal in the future going forward as a community is to try and keep kids in this state here. So in other words, to prevent kids from going from here to here, but to just keep kids in this spot. And what we call this in, in our in the medical term will be something like primary prevention, meaning preventing the complication from ever happening in the first place. And this is perhaps um, well known in the world of stroke. So uh, for people at certain risk of having a stroke, we start them on aspirin, and this reduces their risk of developing strokes by some X percent. And we say, you know, aspirin's easy, it's cheap, it's, it's incredibly safe, but it's pretty safe as things go. And, the, you know, the, 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 the numbers work out. This is what we should do. We're trying to get there with other therapies for ALD. Right now, one of the things we're looking at is vitamin D. Okay. So uh, this is just to sort of give you a sense as to where the uncertainty lies and, and where some of the periods of risk are. I think we, we've highlighted already in this talk that there is a period of risk in childhood for cerebral ALD, and then that risk falls during um, uh, late adolescence. It doesn't go to zero at any point, but it falls. And then it rises again to some 
um, lower level over the later part of life, but some individuals just don't develop cerebral LD, and we want to keep everyone in that category. That, that's the long-term goal. So years ago, we started looking at uh, vitamin D as a risk factor. We, this is data we've shown before. This is from my lab and from Josh Bonkowski's lab. Um, where I, um, so our lab looked at vitamin D with the Kennedy Krieger Institute and Patrick Alberg's group. Um, we found, uh, and from a very small number of patients, that vitamin D, low vitamin D status, may predispose to risk of later risk of cerebrality. And Josh found something analogous with latitude, meaning. The, you know, the higher you live in the, in the latitude-wise, so if you live up in the Great North or versus the Great South, um, you get less sunlight and you wear more clothes and you're, less, you're outside less time in the wintertime. Um, so you, 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 your vitamin D levels just run a little bit lower, and, and this may be a risk for disease. Um, this prompted this vitamin D study that I've talked about a few times in the past. We had 21 patients enroll. We followed them for a year or more. And uh, so far, I'm happy to say that still none of the kids had developed uh, cerebral disease. That does not mean that it works, but it does. It is. Um, it is at least as a data point. Um, and we looked at a number of factors. We, the first factor we were interested in looking at was understanding how, what kind of doses we need to get kids to the right level. Um, surprisingly, for very young age groups, we don't have that kind of data to get to the levels we were looking for. And so we, we have generated that data now. We have good data. Um, in fact, it's, we have some novel data suggesting that not just weight, but age are, are um, predictors of vitamin D dosing. And we've extended this in larger cohorts. I won't talk about that here, but another time. So we're, we think we're able to um, titrate our doses to the right ranges. We also looked at some biomarkers. We've ta I've talked about these before. Uh, this is um, antioxidant in the brain. We saw that the antioxidant over time went up. That does not mean that vitamin D did it, but it does mean that it happened in correlation with what we were doing. And then there's one signal here that I'm actually quite interested in, and this is um, brain perfusion. Uh, if you were um, here for Dr. Mussolino's talk yesterday, she gave a really terrific um, and detailed talk on brain perfusion as a risk factor in ALD. And low perfusion seemed to be part of the ALD signature. And again, not a causative effect here, but we did see over the course of our study that in the area at risk for developing brain lesions, the brain perfusion in, these, in our patients on average increased. And this is a neat signal. So we also have since looked at metabolomic data from uh, Dr. Mike Schneider's lab and lipidomic data from Dr. Kemp's lab. I, I would say we don't have, we're, we're working on integrating this data to sort of explain some of the signatures. What we can say that we saw changes. Um, we're not exactly sure what those changes mean quite yet, but we will be talking more about those and we're interested in looking more at those changes in the future. I should pause here and say we did not see a, a decrease in very long chain fatty acids and that's kind of, I think, one of the, one of the um, probably more interesting questions that people were wondering about. There was not a clear um, decrease in very long chain fatty acids and saturated very long chain fatty acids. So um, there will be there were changes in other fatty acids, and we'll we'll, we'll go to those another time. But obviously, the next step, our goal is to try and get to a larger study of vitamin D to understand in a more meaningful way: is does supplementing vitamin D uh, help prevent brain lesions? you know, from ever developing. And we don't know the answer to that question. Um, we're all hopeful it's something so simple and easy, but, but we, we just don't know at this point. So we have developed a study, but I want to take a quick survey here because this is real, this is a, this is a non-scientific survey, but can um, the families in, in the room raise their hands for me and um, just so we can get a sense of, of who's here. Yeah, families and advocates. Sure. Any ALD families, yeah, any ALD families here in the room. So um, keep your hand up if you're currently taking vitamin D. Okay, so it's a smaller number. Um, keep your hand up if, you're, if your child is or still taking vitamin D. Okay, small number. Okay, good. Now, I want to ask, um, if, you're, if you had the option to enroll in a trial that lasted for three years, <laughs> where you might receive placebo for some portion of that three years. Would you, tell me, raise your hand if, you, if you're pretty sure that both you and your spouse would be willing to go on to placebo, take a risk, take, 
take the chance of going on placebo for some part of that three years for your child? One, maybe two, so maybe three. Okay, so that's that's helpful. Okay, here. So I do. So I, I, I ask you this a little bit here. We, we're going to try and get a more formal survey because I think this certainly have my own uh, instincts on what the answer to that question is, and that's what we've been working on. But I think the NIH would like us to be more specific about our instincts here. So here's what here's what we here's a, on the left there is what we call a um, you know a, a power a power curve or a power analysis where we've estimated how many patients we'll need to get to some level of certainty. And without getting too far into the details here, we're looking at needing about, um, you know, somewhere between 250 to 350 um, patients enrolled for three years of observation between the ages of zero and 10, you know, staying on drug just for a single arm of the trial. So if we did two arms, we'd need, we'd need about twice that many. And on the right here is about the number of patients we think we uh, have been diagnosed on the OCs. These are my estimates based on newborn screening rates and birth rates. So I would say right now we're at about maybe in the realm of perhaps 600 families. And we need half those families or more to enroll in a trial, meaning we need at least 50% of the entire population of ALD families in the US to be, for both parents to be willing to take a risk on their child being enrolled at placebo over three period. My, my calculus here is there's no way we'll get close to those numbers. We could get, I know we could get some families, but I don't think we would get close to the half of the population. I, I think we'll have trouble getting half the population enrolled, period. But that's the, those are the kind of um, hurdles we're looking at here. So we did something different. Um, so we have this uh, really terrific group of ALD investigators here um, can you raise your hand if you're in the room and you're, and you're involved in this study? I've got Troy, Ali, um, Amina, Amina, looking at you, you're in our study here. Um, Eric and Florian is around somewhere. Florian's involved as well. But um, anyways, we've got a really, um, an all-star team here of ALD doctors and um, uh, MR spectroscopists and, and others involved in this study. And here's an endocrinologist. Um, we put together what we think is really uh, a really promising study, and our study aims are as follows. To one, aim one, you know, minor, minor as, easy as, as easy as it sounds, determine if vitamin D supplementation reduces the rate of ALD brain lesions, simple as that. Aim two, determine if UV exposure reduces the rate of ALD brain lesions. So it turns out UV exposure has effects independent of making vitamin D, so it, it does other things that are good for our brain and bad for our, and bad for our skin, um, but good for our brain and blood um, that are important for biology. And it's possible that some of these effects, that vitamin D may be, may be not the full story, that it, at the very least UV is doing something else too. We're interested in knowing whether this is true. Um, so we think this is a really important question among other things. And then using MRI to understand what either vitamin D or UV exposure is doing here. So what we've done is we've, we've set up study sites um, across the country. These are highlighted in yellow here. So we've got Stanford, Utah, Minnesota, uh, KKI, Hopkins. Um, uh, we've got Cornell and then um, MGH is involved um, in, uh, in certain aspects of the study to help us generate data to understand um, this phenomena. Um, this is what we've submitted so far to the NIH. And we've built this very complex um, approach where we are aggregating historical data, um, both, both ver very old and more recent, and comparing that to um, prospective data, meaning data going forward, where we would try and enroll as many patients across the country, so as many families who could possibly participate anywhere. If you live in the most rural part of Wyoming or North Dakota, you'd be able to participate without coming to a study site. We would sign you up over a Zoom visit. We would have you go to a local laboratory um, at a LabCorp facility and have blood drawn and followed regularly. And you'd get your MRIs done locally and mail them to us and we would read them. So we want to make this really accessible and as easy as possible. And our goal here is to try and <clears throat> build a single arm study looking forward of you know 300 or more boys taking vitamin D 
um, for three years. That's a long time and followed as we normally would. So we're basically you know, trying to deliver the normal standard of care and we're simply adding vitamin D on top of it and we're comparing that to what we think would be a similar set of kids look in, in, in uh, historical data sets. There are lots of challenges with that kind of analysis, but we really think that this is the best way forward and that's what we're trying to do. Um, this is essentially a map of, here's the year-on-year -year risk of developing a cerebral lesion, um, roughly extrapolated according, um, they've taken some, I've taken some liberties with the estimations here, but this is an actual curve from Dr. Malik's data with my percentages imputed here, that goes with a grain of salt. But here, and each of these represents a kind of a group of kids enrolling at certain ages that we think we could enroll. So it's a lot of individuals followed for a long time. And this is an unusual study. This is a hard study to do. I mean, uh, full stop, it's really a challenging study to do and, and the interpretation is challenging. But it does some really neat things, even over and above looking at vitamin D. I, I mentioned there, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about who's going to get cerebral lesions and who doesn't. We don't know why some people get lesions. We're looking, you know, in this study we're focusing on UV and vitamin D as possible risk modifiers. But we know with nearly 100% certainty that, that even if they're involved, they're, they're far from the whole story. There are other things that are influencing this too. So a study like this allows us to collect data on hundreds of um, families and kids over many years. This is the kind of study we've been dreaming about doing in ALD for probably as long as we've had ALD, you know, known, known about ALD, period. It allows us to collect, um, you know, follow lots of kids in brain MRIs and help them achieve a good standard of care across the country. It allows us to understand also just, by the way, the natural history of adrenal insufficiency, which we think is really important. And then it allows us to collect blood and, um, and other factors to understand what signatures in the blood or what factors, other, whether it's vitamin D or other things, are predisposing to risk and what are the ones that reduce risk. Um, so these are, these, this study itself would provide, I think we were estimating, us, um, uh, th I think it was three to 5,000 blood samples to draw from over many years. So um, you've seen from Dr. Kemp's talk and other talks too about the difficulty of understanding whether certain genes, genotypes, put you at risk for disease or another. This would be probably the, 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 our best chance at figuring this out over the, in the next you know, five to seven years. It's a real, give us a really good opportunity to do that, where we would know both the genotype and the, um, and the evolution of MRIs and other metrics. And um, this is the kind of study that we would want to, to really achieve that in the best way possible. So this is over and above what we're trying to do with vitamin D. This is a really, we think, a really neat opportunity for the community um, to do. So the NIH uh, received it, and they actually really liked it. I mean, they actually had a lot of nice things to say. They, so I'm quoting them. We already thought this was an exciting application that addresses a significant unmet clinical need. They, this is their review from over the summer. Reviewers noted that the environmental factors have been understudied in leukodystrophies and high cost and risk adverse events associated with the currently available treatments make a safe, easily available, low cost therapy extremely attractive, They're referring to vitamin D. The study is led by a team of multiple um, principal investigators with diverse expertise and includes internationally renowned experts in ALD. And then, you know, and then you say, uh, but we, the things we didn't like is we, we, they wanted a few more things. They want better justification for a foregoing a randomized trial, as, we, as I alluded to at the beginning. They want more explanation about some of the other factors that might influence that we might miss in our, in our study design. You know, that no one's happy with the complexity and cost. This is a really expensive study. Um, so would you be surprised if I told you this was over $3 million, over $10 million? This is a 13 million, 13, almost $14 million study to run. Very expensive. This is a huge investment from, you know, from the taxpayers of, of America in, into, into our community. So it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, and I think this is the kind of thing that, that is, but we think the reason, uh, the best reason to do this is not just actually to learn if vitamin D is a cheap, safe therapy for ALD, which it may, may or may not be, but also to develop a really rich um, natural history database for investigators like Dr. Lund and Dr. Kemp and uh, Ann Moser and others to, 
to help understand what, what are the risk factors that really are at play for developing cerebral disease or AMEN or um, adrenal insufficiency. This is our great opportunity to do that at scale and relatively quickly in, in the scheme of things. So um, we have a, a planned response here. Our goal is to resubmit this in March 2023. We plan to add some additional sites. We, we've already gener our lab has already gener generated some additional preliminary data in some uh, in our, our new mouse model. Um, we have other collaborators we've talked to about generating some preliminary data. Um, we have the, uh, some updated publication data, some of the key manuscripts, and um, I, I'm interested in trying to collect survey data to get to. to convince ourselves, as well as the NIH, that really a placebo-controlled trial or some version of it, and there are other reasons that, by the way, a placebo-controlled trial is really tricky here, is, is, um, is, it would be really tough. So this is our update. This is, um, this is where, um, where we're at, where we're going. Um, I wanted, we we're interested, I was so impressed yesterday with, uh, I mean, the level of sophistication in our community, too, is, is uh, so I think keeping the community up to date on some of the nitty-gritty details here is useful, but um, this is where, um, this is where we, where we want to go as a community. I think, um, just keep, I'll be on the lookout for um, uh, some, a survey when it, uh, when it, um, when it comes, your input will be really helpful. And, um, and if you could join us at the ALD summer camp, totally separate from this, but uh, but I'm just plugging it again. Um, please do. I want to thank um, first um, the NIH for funding the original uh, vitamin D trial. It was a, also an expensive trial, but um, but uh, the uh, funding comes from the NINDS. So I want to thank our program officer, Jill Morris, who's been really helpful at guiding this application and uh, and, uh, and our, our our research here through the process. Um, I want to thank uh, the Broussard family and the Adler family for helping fund single C RNA sequencing data, which I didn't show here. We'll show it a future um, that we showed in the past in future talks. And um, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Ben Ben Lenais here. Thank you. Um, ben and his wife have been hugely supportive of supporting the postdocs in our lab, and I, I, maybe a round of applause for for these families. Um, so, yeah. So this has been the ALD community supporting um, supporting itself in a great way. So thank you very much. I will um, look forward to updating you again our, with our uh, successful application next time around. And um, thanks, everyone. Thank Listen. you so much, Keith. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Lenhan. And I see a question already. Kelly, do you have a mic? No worries. Thank you. Um, so I'm thinking about this like placebo dilemma and how quickly I pulled my hand down when you said the word placebo. Um, and part of the reason for that is because when I saw the great work that you were doing, I printed that off clinicaltrials.gov, I took it to my local endo and I said, how can we replicate this without having, you know, to go to California and New York? Um, so I have that knowledge and probably a lot of us in the room who pulled our hands down do that. My son's levels and my levels were low you know, to the point where we should have been supplementing. So I'm wondering, could a placebo group exist? And I know it wouldn't be called a placebo at that point where they could get just enough so that they're in that safe zone. Um, you know, because I know it's a wide range of 30 to 80 or something like that, where like they're just in that safe zone and that's your placebo. And then maybe the, the other group is getting the higher dose. Is that possible? Yeah, there are a few different ways that people have tried to do vitamin D studies. So you're, it's kind of a two-dose group where you get a medium dose and a high dose, maybe. Um, and that's actually how a lot of vitamin D studies were done. They would do just kind of a, a minimal supplementation of like 400 800 IU. And then they would do the other, the other arm would be the, the full therapy of like, you know, 1,000 or 5,000 or something. Um, so uh, some of you may have noticed that vitamin D study, or may know that vit most vitamin Ds, many vitamin Ds has been done in adults have actually not shown an effect um, to, to target the things they were supposed to do, prevent Alzheimer's, prevent diabetes, or, or I should say treat, you know, some, treat some of these diseases, when they were expected to do so. Um, now, there are a number of reasons that these things may have happened. One is um, they're often targeting adults. Um, we, have, we, we actually have reason to think vitamin D is actually more meaningful in childhood than it is in adulthood. Um, like a lot of nutrients we get in life, calories, uh, protein, other things that you can get a l later in life and it doesn't do the same things it would have done when you had it when you were a baby. Um, but even a small amount of vitamin D is actually important. Um, so if you give even a small dose um, to 
a, a child, you can bump their level up in a way that's meaningful. We don't know what that meaningful threshold is, but um, in the in the opinion of, of vitamin D experts, I guess, I guess including me, with a caveat, and that I, I do other things other than vitamin D, um, that uh, there's seems to be uh, in many diseases a threshold. So you get above a certain level, and it kind of levels off. We don't know that that's true for ALD at all. Uh, if there's any meaningful signal or effect, or, or let alone a threshold, but getting above, um, getting people out of insufficiency is. I would say is important. And that's kind of a standard of care for pediatric practice. So if you diagnose somebody with low vitamin D, you put them on something. I mean, it's, it sort of becomes an ethical dilemma there. You, you don't just sort of watch them and say, oh, let's, this, this child is, is insufficient by, stand, by current standards. We're not going to do anything. You, you kind of have, you're kind of obliged to intervene. So that's one reason it's hard to do a placebo is you're kind of obliged to intervene if you know. And, um, and then you're also, uh, a, you know, there may be a there may be a therapeutic effect from even a small dose. There's one other really important <laughs> really important reason here is there's no real placebo. No one has a vitamin D level of zero in this room, and so everyone has some vitamin D um, because we make it ourselves and we eat it, um, and that's the baseline. And if we don't have it, you know, I mean, I um, it's uh, you know if we're not already taking it as a supplement, it's very easy to take if we if the idea is proposed, and so it's tough to do that. It is a possibility. We, we probably could do that. We could. We would definitely improve enrollment if we did a medium dose and high dose. But I actually don't think it would. I think we would. It would fail in the way other studies have failed, where we would see, ah, there was no difference between these two doses. Therefore, that doesn't work. Um, or if we said, uh, oh, um, you know, we, we put everyone on this, and and um, you know, it didn't show effect. But if you look at the kids who were insufficient, for you know, and went to sufficiency, that's where the risk is. So it's you just need to get people out of insufficiency to a sufficient level, and that may may be all the all the benefit that's needed. And I just want to emphasize again that that does not. I don't think anyone's under illusion that that would guarantee a protection. Period. Um, there are unequivocally going to be other things that influence, but I just want to make that uh, crystal clear. But that's a great question, Miranda. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? One last question from Chris, and then I do think we have to move on. Yeah, is there uh, any data looking from the opposite direction of the people who are either getting transplants or consulting with transplant teams, uh, just sort of taking a survey of them and seeing what proportion of them were taking vitamin D? Um, or, or whether the demand, uh, as more people are taking vitamin D, then the demand for transplants goes down, but also, I guess, surveillance is going up at the same time. The, I, I guess, is there any look looking, uh, collecting data from that side? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, so the, um, the, that's one of the things actually we're going to be looking at in the, in the database. So we'll have several looks at, we'll be able to do a, Apples to apples comparison and historical data to try and, as best we can, understand who was taking vitamin D and or who had a good vitamin D level. It, that's a little tricky because there's the chart may not reflect who is taking something over the counter at home. But that's one thing we would look at in the, in the study. That one requires not a ton of resources, but a little bit of resource to do. And so it's people, it's, um, it, we would need a little bit of funding to do that. But we plan to do that um, as part of this study. It's a good, good point. And then as for the demand over time, um, it's, uh, th that wouldn't be tricky, but it's, it's actually a really interesting thought. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to step out down here and um, see, the, see the lectern. So thank you.